Hi, my name is Rob Mulla, and I'm a data scientist working on the NFL's Digital Athlete Program. So we're so excited today to, for myself, Betty, and Jarvis to be sharing about some of the work that we've been doing in collaborating between the NFL and AWS to improve player health and safety. So a brief overview of what we're going to be presenting today. Uh, first, we're going to take a look at NFL's digitally, Digital Athlete Program what it is and how we're leveraging data to make the game safer. Then we're gonna talk in about a specific problem we've been working on uh, that's part of the digital athlete program. And this is using computer vision to detect helmet impacts using video. Uh, we'll talk about the technology and algorithms we're using to solve this problem. And then Betty will come share some details about how we implement this solution and Jarvis will give us an update about how uh, we are working on it today and some of the next steps that we're gonna be uh, working on in this project. So what is the digital athlete? Uh, well, it's a joint effort between the NFL and AWS to use AI and machine learning to build digital representation of an NFL player. So basically we have a lot of data about NFL athletes from performance metrics pulled from tracking devices that they wear to all the historic injury trends and all the information about the plays that are run and different scenarios that players are in. Through aggregating and centralizing all this data, we're able to create models that allow us to better track all the, that data that's been uh, collected about players and eventually predict scenarios where players are at high risk of injury and so that we can take preventative measures. So this quote is from the lead data scientist on the Digital Athlete Program. It does a great job of summarizing the philosophy of the Digital Athlete Program. Our main goal is to fully understand everything involved in players' injuries and player health. In order to do that, we really need to know what is happening, happening surrounding those injuries, but also what's happening before and after those injuries occur. So now we're gonna dive into a specific project that we're working on with the Digital Athlete Program. This is uh, the Helmet Impact Detection Project. The goal of this project is to automate the process of counting the number of helmet impacts taken on by players during games using computer vision. The idea that is by automating this process that we can then build comprehensive histories of these impacts on players and the season and trends. The data then will inform decision makers on how we can improve the safety of the game. Okay, so I'm gonna show a video clip here. And when I show the video clip, I want you to try to see if you can identify every definitive impact we define a definitive impact or exposure when, is when a helmet trajectory changes upon con contact. So take a look at this video and see if you can identify those. Okay, so there was a lot going on there in the short clip. Now keep in mind we're not only interested in the count of impacts, but when they occur and which athletes they are involved in the event. Historically, the NFL actually had human labelers go through a subset of games, and each human would take about 27 mi minutes to label a play like this. So with 27 minutes to review a play, for a single season that would take over a year for a single person to actually label a whole season. That's without sleeping or taking any time off. So that's just not feasible to have humans try to label the entire season and every impact that occurs. And that's where our product comes into place. In this next video, I'm gonna show you the output of our machine learning pipeline. You're gonna see bounding boxes around the helmets. These are automatically detected and then the bounding boxes will turn red when an impact is detected. Let's take a look. You 
You can see the red bounding boxes around the player helmets when impact is detected. So you can see visually that it does a pretty good job. And um, it not only is it identifying when the impacts occur, but it's tracking which player is associated with that and um, so that we can aggregate that for the player. When compared against human labor labelers, even our expert labelers, our current pipeline slightly outperforms most human labelers in terms of both accuracy and recall. So this is a pretty complex computer vision pipeline, and it's broken down into a few components. The first is object detection. So that's just identifying all the helmets in every frame of every video. Then we use a, a process to actually track each of those helmets and assign them to the correct pl players using optimization. Third thing we do is actually detect when the impact occurs on each helmet. And finally, we combine different views because we have multiple camera angles of the same plays to get a single perspective or, or single comprehensive player history of their uh, helmet impacts through the history of a season. Now, the key to all machine learning projects is to have a good label data set. We leverage uh, SageMaker Ground Truth to assist us in labeling the set of plays. We also had our in-house expert reviewer who went through and confirmed when the impacts occurred. And the real interesting thing is we're, now that we created the first version of this pipeline, we're able to feed back those labels from our model and have the reviewers go through and verify if they're correct or not. Now, I, I do want to mention that the, the solutions that we worked through uh, came out of a collaboration between NFL and AWS to, to crowdsource solutions. Um, and we, at a, with NFL and AWS and BioCore, worked together to implement these solutions, improve them, and actually scale them up on AWS's system. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about the helmet detection. Um, this you might not think is too hard, but actually uh, having a good helmet detector is really important for our system because if we can't detect a helmet, we can't actually detect if an impact occurred. And uh, the sort of novel approach that came out of um, the solution that we, we had from the Kaggle solution was taking a two-stage approach. So we actually have an object detector that detects all helmets in every frame and then determines the average size of those helmets. Then we have a second model that's trained on expecting certain size of helmets and uh, predicts those in the second stage. And this simple yet effective trick really improved the accuracy of our helmet detector. All right, next I'm gonna talk about helmet assignment. So that's actually figuring out which helmets are associated with which, which player. Now, in the NFL, each player, when they're on the field, is wearing a tracking device in their shoulder pads. This tracks their speed, their uh, acceleration, and their position on the field. These sensors um, are used, then, in our pipeline to determine which helmet is associated with which player. So the idea is quite simple. On the left here, you can see the NGS data for this play. And on the right, you see the two views where we would detect helmets. And we're basically trying to find who's linked to who. So for instance, you can see that player number 26 is associated with this dot in the NGS data. Um, it seems simple here when we're looking at it right before the start of the play. But when the play is uh, in the middle of the action, the assignment actually becomes a very complicated problem. So the way we tackle this problem is through three steps. First, we cluster the helmets that we've detected into two different colors. And uh, we use a clustering algorithm to do that. Then we um, take those helmets and we put them into a bird's eye view using a CNN uh, model. And 
try to match those as best as we can with the helmets or the points that we have in the NGS system. And then finally, we actually track the helmet throughout the duration of the play, and we smooth out any mislabels that might have occurred throughout the play. So this just shows you the first step. Uh, you can see that we take a helmet and uh, do some cropping around to make sure that we have the exact portion of the helmet that matters. And then we use a clustering algorithm to determine if it's on team A or team B and separate out the helmets into the two different teams. And then we can know which those might be associated with in the, um, in the NGS data. Next, we do this point registration. So I already mentioned before, but we use a CNN um, neural network to convert these helmets into a bird's eye view uh, format. And then we use an algorithm similar to iterative closest point to find the best match between the points of the helmets and the points of the NGS data. And that process actually for each frame has 40 different random permutations it tries to minimize the loss between the, the two different types of points. Uh, you can see here on the right, the light labels are the NGS data and the dark points are the helmets that are detected. And this looks like a pretty good match um, that the algorithm has found for this play. Now the third and last step of the player assignment process is actually looking across frames. So at this point, everything has been done on every individual frame in the video on its own. But this, uh, this process actually looks at tracking each helmet throughout the duration of the entire play and looking at the labels. So you can see here, just an example, we have three helmets uh, assigned to either player one, player two, or player three. And for the most part, they are assigned to the, the same players, but sometimes, especially when players are crossing paths or really close to each other, those labels can get switched. Um, so using this process, we identify these locations where they've switched and correct them. And this actually really does improve the quality of our um, assignment portion of our uh, model. So next, I'm going to hand it off to Betty, who's going to talk a little bit about how we detect helmet impacts themselves. Thank you so much, Rob. I am Betty, and I'm going to go over some of the details when it comes to impact detection. Yep, so um, after we've identified the helmet bonding box, um, as well as the player identification, the next step is really to detect if a player has an impact at any given moment during the play. So for us to really do that, we follow a three-step approach. First, we take the output from the assignment pipeline that Rob just presented. After that, we generate 3D tensors across all the frames, and that's our feature clips. After that, we'll feed that into our classification model, the impact detection classification model. That would then tell us if a player's had any impact at any time during the particular play. Let me now dive a little into the details. So for our feature generation, what we do is that we first take the information from assignment, and then we actually create 16 frame clips for each player in each frame. So what does that mean? That means if we're looking at frame 8 and for player 44, we'll actually take the frame from all the way to frame, uh, from frame 1 to 16. The intuition behind it is really that well, we don't think it's enough for a model to only look at one image and determine whether there's an impact or not. Since uh, the impact is actually a series of motions, so it's better if we actually feed in that series of action to the model so that it also learns the temporal elements or it's able to predict on that temporal elements. Um, the second part is really trying to figure out how big we want the crop to be. Remember, from the upstream pipeline, we're able to get the helmet bonding box. But for us to actually determine if it's an impact or not, just the, helmet, just the bonding box is not enough. We want to get 
as much information around that bonding box or around that player as possible, right? So we also want to include other surrounding pixels to provide more context. Um, so we take the helmet bonding box and then we enlarge it so we take on that additional information. Um, and then we also make sure that the center helmet is already, it's always centered in the frame so that the way the model is not confused and the helmet size is always around 40 times 40, so it's recognizable. So this way, the model is able to take the helmet, but also surrounding information with that helmet. Um, so those are the two steps that we have with feature generation. So after you've done that, you can see at the end, we're able to obtain this tensor that's 16. Um, that's the 16 frames that we're extracting times three, which is the numbers of channel that we have times 128 times 128 which is the size of the which is the size of the crop so that's the width and the, the height of the crop um, an example of that it's shown on the slide so you see that we have these 16 crops and then in this particular example we're making predictions for um, frame 8 for player 44 so you can see in this case, we're extracting all the information from frame one about that player all the way to frame 16 so that the model has a good idea of what's happened with that uh, player during that, those time frame as well as there's a lot more context because we're not just focused on that one bonding box. And if you want to um, extract, let's say, features for frame nine for the same player, then you have to I extract frame all the way from frame two to frame 17. Um, another thing worth noting is that during training, we also do um, transformation on these clips. So we do rotation as well as other techniques to make sure that our model is really learning the clips and not just memorizing the clips. So after we had that clips prepared the next step is really to feed those information into our um, model, our impact detection classification model. So the model architecture that we have is a ResNet 34 CNN with the temporal shift module. Let me, let me break it down for you. So ResNet 34 is a 34 layered convolutional neural network that can really be utilized as a state of art image classification uh, model. So this is a model that's pre-trained on ImageNet, and it is different from a traditional neural network because it takes residuals from each layer and uses them in the subsequent connected layer. So it's similar to residual neural networks for uh, text prediction. But the skip connections in ResNet really helps to solve the problem of vanishing gradient. Um, it also has a really good performance, and the size is not uh, too big, so it help us during training um, because it's not going to take too much time, so it allows us to do more iteration as well. It's also gotten decent rankings over different competitions over the past few years. So now, that's a 2D CN model. So it's great with uh, detecting the spatial features that we have, right? But remember, since we're feeding in the clips, it actually contains a lot of temporal elements which means that there's a lot of action in those clips. And we want our model to also be able to learn from those actions, because it would inform us or tell us whether it's the impact or not. Normally, in order to do that task, we use a 3D CNN approach. But the problem with using 3D CNN is that typically it's very complex, and uh, it's also very computationally expensive. So this is really where the temporal shift module comes in. So what the temporal shift module um, is able to do is that it's able to achieve 3D CNN accuracy, but at 2D CNN um, compute. So how does that work exactly? The temporal shift module basically shifts part of the channel along the temporal dimensions, thus facilitate information exchange across different neighboring frames. So this way, the model's really learning about the temporal elements in the clips that you're sending, sending to it. It can be used with any 2D CNN backbone. So in our case, we picked ResNet 34 as the backbone that we're using. And because it's just shifting, 
uh, we're not really adding additional parameters and we're not adding additional compute resource either. As a result of it, we're able to achieve really high accuracy, uh, but it really speeds up during our inference time. And since we are actually making predictions on a lot of videos, having the speed up really helps during that process. Um, one thing worth noting is that the model is also fine-tuned using our custom data set. So that is the data set that I mentioned previously, the 16 times 3 times 128, 128 crops that we are feeding into the model to make sure that the model is really custom to our particular uh, data set. And then during training, we also did upsampling to deal with the data imbalance as there are cases where you, don't, you really don't see impacts as, um, as often. So hopefully that gives you a brief overview of what our impact detection model does. With the meantime, I'll show you a quick clip of the predictions that we're able to make on one, um, on one play. So this is play, this is one play we made the prediction on. On your top left, you're also able to see the total numbers of total positives. There's also false positive, positives and uh, false negatives that's being displayed on the video as well. So you can keep track of that as I'm playing the video. Uh, in addition, our prediction will be in yellow and the actual uh, impact will be in red. So let me just play that video so you can see. Yep, so you can see that our model is actually pretty good at detecting um, impacts in most scenarios. There are a few cases where we missed, and the, result, the reason for that is sometimes um, it's, you're in a really crowded area, or sometimes you just simply cannot see the impact because uh, in that particular uh, perspective or in that particular video, that impact's blocked by, by something else. So wouldn't it be helpful if we actually have other perspectives that can help solve this problem. Uh, it turns out that we actually do. So if you recall, the point that what we're trying to do here is really trying to build a comprehensive history per play per game for all of these players. So it is very critical for us to utilize information from all different angles, from all different uh, perspectives, so that we're able to actually make that prediction on that, uh, on that player. So in order for us to really bring the results together from different angles, we first merge all the predictions together from different perspectives, then we'll perform a deduping process. So we avoid uh, double counting. So the deduping process basically works that when the same player experiences a helmet impact within a window between two or more uh, views, we basically align the player exposure and count that impact as one. So for example, you will see player A has an impact, um, let's say frame one, or in the first second from the sideline perspective. And then if we see uh, player A has the same impact um, frame two from a different perspective as end zone, then we basically dedupe the, the data set. Um, and then count that impact as, uh, as just one impact instead of counting it as two impact. So after we've done all that processing and from you know, assignment all the way to impact detection, uh, we combined the, and then combining different perspectives, uh, we basically compared our re results against the previous process that Rob described, uh, which is a menu um, labeling effort by a group of non-expert humans, and then we're actually able to achieve a better score. So in our comparison, you can see that we uh, achieved a higher F1 score, uh, 12%. Uh, we lost a little bit on precision, but we did really well in terms of recall, which means that our model was really able to detect impacts that weren't uh, picked up by those uh, human labelers. Um, in addition, because of the um, fusion that we're able to do on 
multiple perspectives. It really allowed us to use information across all angles. And next, I'll uh, play a video um, with four different perspectives on the same play. So you can see uh, with everything that we've done so far, we're able to line up the impacts um, as well as detecting um, the impacts with that. So you can see that the uh, white line basically represents the um, same impact, and then our impacts are highlighted in, uh, in red. Hopefully that gave you a good overview of how we implemented uh, impact detection as well as the fusion process. Now I'll pass it on to Jarvis to talk about SNAP detector as well as how we really scaled up the solution to meet our needs. Thanks, Betty. So at this point, um, we've established a set of models that can robustly detect and assign helmet impacts to individual players, thereby creating an exposure data set um, for every game and play. However, we want to have the ability to go back in time to establish long-term tre exposure trends for individual NFL players across seasons. Um, for about as long as the NFL has collected uh, the key NGS data set that, uh, you know, that Rob described earlier in this presentation. Um, all doing this to help inform future, future mitigations uh, for, you know, for the league. But the challenge is that in the videos that we've been uh, describing uh, earlier, the videos have not always been synchronized with next-gen stats historically. Um, so essentially, we developed an additional algorithm to kind of put in, be in between it before all of our uh, impact detection steps in order to synchronize the uh, NGS data and the source videos. And kind of rather than approaching it as a direct detection problem, um, which would require kind of further human labeling, uh, we leverage the fact that there's actually a very distinct visual event in American football. Uh, the ball snap where most players are actually motionless beforehand. So this event is actually labeled in, it, in the next gen stats tracking data and um, we can you know, then detect ball snap in any individual video and align it to a common, as a common timestamp to align NGS and uh, you know, the videos that we're using um, to kind of combine these, uh, both of these data modalities. And we approach this problem in three steps. First, we stabilize the camera um, to a set frame, and this takes away the spurious movement from uh, broadcast cameras that are capable of pan tilt zoom at any given time. Next, we track helmets and apply those stabilizations to those helmets um, that we can kind of see in this uh, video at number two. Um, and the third, since effectively with those first two steps, we've essentially changed a video detection problem into a time series problem, we can then kind of apply standard change point techniques and other time series techniques into, into this pipeline as a, as a standard time series detection problem. And at, um, we detect the state change of the movement of the combined players and detect the moment in time um, that that state change occurs, and that is usually the ball snap event in the videos that we're dealing with, down to a subframe, um, kind of sub sub five frame on 60 uh, frame per second video uh, accuracy level. In addition to the modeling steps that we've described, we also needed to scale out the inference pipeline to run a large number of videos from all previous NFL seasons in order to create this uh, type of exposure, historical exposure data set that we wanted in order to inform future mitigations. We were able to scale out the model pipeline by using AWS services like AWS Batch, um, Amazon DynamoDB, and AWS Step Functions, providing a comprehensive data set that's never been aggregated before of helmet impacts and exposures for downstream analysis at the club and league level. I'll walk us through the overall architecture design in the next sections um, here. 
So we start by with video already indexed into, roughly indexed into game, play, and view combinations, all pushed to Amazon S3 as MP4 files. We've designed a job submission process that allows us to submit um, these videos into a queue to be processed by our pipeline. This can be triggered manually or automatically once a video lands into the target location in S3. Each video queue is fed through our step function workflow as an individual video task, which orchestrates a series of container tasks backed by AWS batch GPU instances for deep learning models in our pipeline. Um, so this includes snap detection, uh, helmet assignment, and helmet impact detection that were described earlier. Each individual task and the overall workflow is then tracked with a combination of step functions and DynamoDB. Because each video is its own individual workflow, we can easily horizontally scale out into to more quickly run uh, through a video, any individual video queue, uh, while kind of keeping track of what tasks and models have already been run. I'm kind of breaking down each task within this overall workflow a little further, as indicated by the smaller yellow boxes in the, in the top part of the, this diagram. We leverage containerization uh, technologies and AWS Batch in order to consistently and robustly run our trained models across a variety of GPU machines across our fleet. And once all of these videos have been cleared, we can push the model results to S3 and allow for users to query those results using Amazon Athena and any downstream application for further analysis, um, you know, in SageMaker or any kind of arbitrary arbitrary analysis uh, analysis software. So in conclusion, the NFL, in partnership with AWS and BioCore, have been working on building out the leading sports uh, injury surveillance program. Uh, We've outlined essentially just one of the projects in this initiative during our talk today, reviewing our process for identifying helmet impact exposures across multiple NFL seasons. Uh, we're currently working on even further improving the results from this pipeline through better models and additional data. So we hope to kind of share the progress on this project and other projects within the NFL di NFL's digital athlete program soon and show how machine learning can essentially be used to actively make the game uh, safer. So thanks for listening to our talk and uh, yeah, that's it.